Link TV, connecting you to the world. Link TV is viewer supported. Watch more at linktv.org. Link TV presents Mosaic World News from the Middle East. Here are today's top stories. Iraq's Shiite coalition nominates Maliki for prime minister. Militants torch NATO tankers in Pakistan. And police revolt leads to failed coup attempt in Ecuador. Mosaic World News from the Middle East begins now. The Shazam People's Liberation Movement, the SPLM, warned that disputes between unity supporters and secession supporters in Sudan may lead to a new war between the North and the South. Sudanese oil minister and leader in the SPLM, Luwal Ding, said that any undermining of the referendum will lead to a real disaster in the country. Within this context, Sudanese political parties have called for joint efforts to guarantee a free and fair referendum. Mohammed Tayyip reports from Khartoum. As the date of the referendum, which will decide the fate of the South, draws near, polarization and altercations between unity supporters and supporters of secession are increasingly growing. This polarization is dominating Sudan in various aspects, not only among the political parties, but also among the general public and the different social stratums. Overnight, this issue has turned into a major source of concern. Regardless of the result of the referendum, there is a possibility that the outbreak of conflict and tension will take the country back to civil war. If the people in the South vote for unity and cases of fraud are registered, there would be war, and the opposite is true. Some opposition political parties have called for joint intensive efforts to block any acts that could trigger a war. This call was a precautionary measure to help prevent the ramifications of the referendum result. If our brothers want real peace, they must prepare the proper environment. In order to prevent any loopholes, the referendum in the South must be free and fair. We should all work together, the political parties and the Sudanese people, to ensure peace and achieve peace for all of us, even if secession takes place in the South. However, political observers believe that mobilizing without establishing a solid foundation for peace and coexistence in the region, which would create the adequate environment for the referendum, could pose danger to the stability of the entire region. In light of the current polarization, the country could return to war since polarization leads to major divisions in a country. If the people in the South hold the referendum in this atmosphere and the South decides to secede from the rest of the country, it may create problems that could have catastrophic consequences. Therefore, reasonable people should adopt a rational approach. Either result of the referendum, unity or secession is causing fear, both regionally and internationally, that tension and violence could take place after the result is announced. The reason being what some have described as the intense polarization and mobilization between the two sides. Mohammed Taib, Al Jazeera, Al Khartoum. تتواصل أزمة تشكيل الحكومة العراقية منذ 208 أيام وإذا لم يتم الإعلان اليوم The Iraqi government formation crisis is entering its 208th day and if Iraq fails today to name the next prime minister which is highly likely it will break the world's record for the longest government deadlock Meanwhile, leaders of the National Alliance which includes the state of law bloc and the National Coalition will meet today to elect their nominee for prime minister All factions and blocs, including the Islamic Supreme Council led by its nominee Adel Abdul Mahdi, are expected to take part in the meeting.
Joining us from Baghdad is our Al Arabiya correspondent, Muntatar Rashid. Muntatar, has the meeting started and how long is it expected to last? No, the meeting has not started yet. It is scheduled for 7 p.m. local Baghdad time. The National Alliance usually holds its meetings around this time. The deadline set by the Islamic Supreme Council for the completion of consultations over Maliki's nomination is due to expire today. The Sadrists have already made up their mind about the election of Maliki as prime minister. This leaves the Islamic Supreme Council out of the picture. The council is expected to render a decision during today's meeting since the deadline is coming up. The National Alliance is expected to cling on to its position of nominating Maliki, regardless of whether the Islamic Council agrees or not. Will anyone be representing Mr. Hakim in the meeting? As far as Hakim is concerned, the Islamic Council may be represented by Hamam Hamoudi or Adel Abdul Mahdi. Having said that, it's possible for none of those leaders to attend the meeting, as was the case in the last two meetings. Regardless of whether the Islamic Supreme Council attends the meeting, it seems that the National Alliance has already made up its mind. Some politicians believe that the Islamic Council will finally yield to the choice of the National Alliance. The council is in no position to conduct political maneuvers, especially considering that it only has seven remaining parliamentary seats. In addition, the Badr organization, led by Hadi Amari, has already endorsed Maliki. This leaves the Islamic Supreme Council alone in the political ring. With seven remaining seats, the Islamic Council doesn't have what it takes to conduct political maneuvers. It can't do much without the support of the predominantly Shiite National Alliance. Therefore, the Islamic Council will likely approve the National Alliance nomination. Iraqi Vice President Adel Abdul Mahdi will hold a press conference later today. Our Al Arabiya correspondent, Muntata Rashid in Baghdad, thank you very much. In another development, Syrian President Bashar al Assad is scheduled to visit Tehran tomorrow. Assad will meet with Iranian President Mahmoud Ahmadinejad and top Iranian officials. The official Syrian Sana'a news agency said that the Assad Ahmadinejad talks will focus on bilateral relations and the latest developments on the regional and international fronts. The Syrian and Iranian presidents held talks in Damascus on September 18th. The two leaders stressed their country's solid relations and also stressed the importance of helping Iraq overcome its government formation crisis. During a meeting with Assad in Damascus on Wednesday, the head of the Iraqia list, Iyad Alawi, pressed Syria to ask Iran to stop meddling in Iraqi affairs. Ecuador has witnessed an unprecedented development that could have turned the country's state of affairs upside down, including the future of its president, Rafael Correa. The crisis ended with the resignation of the country's chief of police, Freddy Martinez. The plot was led by members of the police and military forces who were protesting a presidential decree that revoked some of their benefits, including pay raises. Clashes erupted between protesters and security forces, killing two officers and injuring dozens of others. Zuhair Sakala reports. A plot to stage a military coup d'etat was about to succeed in Ecuador. The plot was led by members of the police and the military forces who rejected an executive order that canceled some of their benefits. The protesters were determined to reach the top of the executive pyramid in a bid to isolate its president. They stormed government institutions, firing sound and gas bombs. However, the attempt to seize control of this hospital turned deadly. Here, Ecuadorian President Rafael Correa sought refuge, rejecting any dialogue with the protesters under gunfire or pressure. <laughs> They tried to quell the people of Ecuador, who came here to save their president. They fired shots, tear gas bombs, as well as rubber bullets. They attacked some ministers. This is the saddest day of my life. However, the Ecuadorian president didn't lose connection with his nation during or after the attempted coup. While some expressed anger over the austerity measures approved by the parliament, a few days ago, thousands of people gathered to bid loyalty and support for the president. Following the coup attempt, security forces tried to maintain control over the situation, which led to fierce clashes with the rebels, killing two officers and injuring 40 others. <laughs> 
40 جريحة The protest is over a public service law soon to be approved by parliament. However, this doesn't mean that the police and army will lose their rights. In order to bring life back to normal, we need the nation's help. Meanwhile, President Rafael Correa was able to return to his palace amid heavy security escort. Correa's opponents are seeking to topple him through a public referendum. The president is trying to dissolve the National Assembly, of which most members oppose the austerity measures, especially those related to the budget. The austerity measures seem to be behind this latest military disobedience and coup attempt in Ecuador. Bolivia's socialist president, Evo Morales, who is a close ally of Ecuadorian president, Rafael Correa, accused the right wing, which he says is backed by the U.S., of being behind the coup attempt in Ecuador. Police in Pakistan said that about 30 trucks carrying supplies for NATO forces in Afghanistan were attacked in Shikarpur city in Sindh province. The attack took place late last night. The trucks were shot at while stopped at a parking lot, and the drivers were forced to abandon them and escape before the trucks were set on fire. There has been no report of casualties. The attack came one day after NATO authorized a helicopter to enter Pakistani airspace, after Islamabad announced the death of three Pakistani soldiers in an airstrike launched by a NATO aircraft. NATO explained that the aircraft was going after a group of militants. Pakistan described the airstrike as a violation of its sovereignty. Then it prevented all trucks carrying supplies from passing through its border into Afghanistan. هذه هي الطريق التي أغلقتها السلطات الباكستانية واضعة حدا لسيل الإمدادات. Pakistani authorities closed down these roads, blocking the transportation of supplies to ISAF forces, which are led by NATO. Khaybar Road is one of the two major roads that ISAF relies on to receive military and logistic supplies. And of course, it's a strategic road that connects Afghanistan to Pakistan. In other words, the road is vital for the future of the military operations carried out by NATO forces in Afghanistan. However, its closure does not undermine the forces' capability to launch operations against Taliban elements in Afghanistan, but it will most likely cause more tension in the bilateral relations between the U.S. and Pakistan. There shouldn't only be an official condemnation, but much more, because we will not tolerate the kind of attack that our soldiers were subjected to. We need to know whether we are allies or not. Since we were attacked, people ask us, are you in the war together, or are you fighting against each other? The relationship between Washington and Islamabad has long been semi-tense. An effort to rebuild trust between the two is still in its primary stage. Only several months have passed since U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton met with her Pakistani counterpart, Shah Mahmoud Qureshi, in a bid to build cooperation within the framework of a new strategy. At that time, it seemed that the U.S.-Pakistani relations were on a path toward rapprochement. The Pakistani government and the U.S. administration administration may try to contain the tension that was caused by the military operations, on which the two disagree. ISAF believes that these operations are necessary to capture al-Qaeda members, while Islamabad believes that they violate its sovereignty. But reducing this tension may not be an easy task, especially as the Pakistani government is facing pressure from the residents near the border. Residents in tribal areas went on strike to protest what they consider the government's failure to protect them. Najla Abu Marai, BBC. Former Pakistani President Pervez Musharraf announced the launch of a new political party earlier today in London. Musharraf said in an interview with the BBC that the incumbent government in Islamabad is inefficient and that the Pakistani people living under these conditions are turning to the military for protection. Musharraf said that he announced his new party in London in fear of getting assassinated upon his return to Pakistan. He also indicated that he may return before the coming elections. Hey, don't turn the channel. We'll return to your Link TV favorites in just two minutes. But first, I'm Wendy Hanamura, Vice President of Link TV, with a reminder that programs like our flagship, Mosaic, World News from the Middle East, are only made possible with your support. When you contribute $100 today, you'll get this new Mir t-shirt that asks, do you have intelligence? We know you do. And what better way to show off your intelligence and your support of Mosaic? 
or if you really want to make a huge impact on Mosaic, make a $1,000 contribution today. And we're going to invite you for a behind-the-scenes look at what it takes to produce Mosaic each day. You'll also get a one-on-one -on -one lunch with producer Jamal Dejani in San Francisco. So make that call, 1-866-485-8848, or go online to linktv.org slash contribute and make a real stand for independent media. It's the quick and easy way to make your tax-deductible contribution online. So here's your chance. Help bring Mosaic to new viewers across America and ensure that it's here for you day after day. Thank you. Did you know that a simple text message could help Mosaic in a big way? When you text LINK TV to 85944, you'll instantly make a $10 donation to Mosaic and LINK TV. So pick up your cell phone and send us a text. Support Mosaic today. What is the secret behind the recent arms deal between Riyadh and Washington? Why are some describing it as the largest arms deal in Saudi and U.S. history? Does it have to do with any specific political projects in the region? Why are the Americans seeking to militarize the region? Welcome to our program dubbed Where's the Truth? Saudi Armament Where To is the title of today's episode. Joining us from Jeddah is Dr. Anwar Ashki, the head of the Middle East Center for Strategic and Legal Studies. First, let's watch the following report. The military deal signed between the U.S. and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia is the largest arms deal in the history of the international arms race. The agreement would authorize Riyadh to buy 84 new fighter jets and 178 helicopters with a choice of three different types. This is in addition to other advanced arms that have not yet been disclosed. According to a report issued by the Wall Street Journal, the U.S. is seeking to improve the military superiority of its Arab allies in a bid to counter the Iranian threat. In another development, U.S. President Barack Obama has reassured Tel Aviv that any arms sold to Saudi Arabia will never be used against the Israeli entity. The Wall Street Journal also disclosed information on other arms deals between the U.S. and Saudi Arabia. Washington agreed to supply Riyadh with warships and anti-missile systems worth tens of billions of dollars. According to company estimates, the deal will help create nearly 75,000 new jobs in the U.S. In addition to this arms deal, which some Western media outlets describe as the deal of the decade, the U.S. agreed to supply some member countries of the Arab Gulf Cooperation Council with advanced weapons worth billions of dollars. The deals aim to help create what some U.S. officials refer to as a safe hub in the region. However, knowledgeable sources believe that Washington is trying to blackmail the oil-rich countries in a bid to counter its growing economic crisis. Welcome back, Dr. Anwar Ashki. We have heard a lot about this arms deal, its goals and ramifications. The deal also received a lot of coverage. Let's start with what the Americans are saying, publicly and secretly. They're saying that the arms deals with Saudi Arabia and the U.S. allies in the region aims to counter Iran. How accurate is this? إلى أي مدى هذا الكلام دقيق؟ بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله. In the name of God, the most merciful, the most compassionate. Thank God and peace and prayers be upon the Prophet, his family and followers. As far as the arms deal is concerned, it's undoubtedly a good opportunity for the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, which is seeking to rearm itself and upgrade its defence system. هذه الأسلحة المملكة العربية السعودية سياستها. The Kingdom of Saudi Arabia has adopted a defensive policy. The Kingdom has no interest in invading other countries. However, as the situation continues to deteriorate in the region, the Kingdom wants to reinforce its defence strategy, and this is why it's acquired arms from the US. The US understands and supports the Saudi position. At this time, does the Kingdom really need to amass these weapons, especially considering the high cost involved? Of course. Several issues have unfolded in the central Gulf region in the Arab territory. First, there are imminent threats of attacks on oil fields in the region. 
Also, there's a possibility of a military strike or a war erupting in the region. Therefore, the oil fields must be protected in the event of any security breach. The Kingdom is primarily seeking to defend its entity, as well as oil fields in the region. Second, the US forces have withdrawn from Iraq, leaving a security and strategic vacuum on the ground. Many groups may be lured into filling this vacuum. Direct talks between the Palestinians and Israel might collapse. Will Netanyahu agree to extend the settlement freeze? And does the prospect for a Palestinian state remain viable? Answers to these questions and more on Ling TV's Mosaic Intelligence Report. U.S. Special Envoy George Mitchell has been frantically shuttling between Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas in Ramallah and Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu in Jerusalem in order to salvage the month-old direct negotiations. The European Union's foreign policy chief, Catherine Ashton, has also been recruited to throw the weight of the EU behind the peace efforts. Even President Obama himself has been personally involved trying to find common ground between the parties. I call upon Israelis and Palestinians and the world to rally behind the goal that these leaders now share. Now is the time for the parties to help each other overcome this obstacle. In fact, in order to secure Israel's support for a 60-day settlement building moratorium extension, the Obama administration, in a draft letter, has offered a string of assurances to Israel ranging from current peace and security matters to future weapons deliveries in the event that peace-related security arrangements are reached. The details of the letter were published on the Washington Institute for Near East Policy website. According to Haaretz, the United States is reportedly incensed over Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's rejection of the draft letter. Equally incensed is the head of the Palestinian negotiation team, Saab Arikat, who said on Wednesday that there are no halfway solutions on the settlements issue. The entire world is now watching. The international community was the one to issue the quartet's statement, which we accepted. President Abu Mazen advised the Americans that in the event Israel continues to build settlements after September 26, we will not take part in the direct talks. Iraqat and other PA officials have been recently hinting to a Palestinian walkout on the negotiations if Israel refuses to stop building settlements in the West Bank and Jerusalem. To make matters worse, Israeli Foreign Minister Avigdor Lieberman, who lives in a West Bank settlement, revived his plan for population exchange before the UN General Assembly. Let me be very clear. I'm not speaking about moving populations, but rather about moving borders to better reflect demographic realities. He suggested ceding parts of Israel with large Arab populations to a future Palestinian state in exchange for Israel keeping large settlement blocks in the West Bank. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has distanced himself from the speech, but many Palestinians believe that this is part of a well-coordinated good cop, bad cop strategy. They also regard the remarks as incitement and advocacy of ethnic cleansing. A recent poll released by the Jerusalem Media and Communication Center revealed that 54% of respondents said that the direct talks serve the national interest of the Palestinians. However, 58% said they believe the Palestinian leadership agreed to hold the talks because of external pressure and more than 55% said that they did not expect the talks to produce major changes in the status quo. But there are rapid changes happening on the ground. Israeli building crews have already resumed work the day after the settlement freeze expired at several settlements, such as Ariel, Oranit, Tekoa, and Adam. Jewish settlers account for just 1% of the population of the West Bank, according to Dutch cartographer Jan de Jong, but are claiming 60% of the land. De Jong, who has been monitoring changes on the ground through satellite imagery and other means, says that construction was going on in the settlements even during the 10-month building moratorium, which has just expired. There are building work every day except on Jewish holidays, that's why I call it a virtual moratorium, he said. 
This is an American issue. Our position is clear. The settlement freeze is the responsibility of Israel and has agreed to it numerous times in the agreements. We don't have to pay the price for Israel to stop these illegal acts that range from land theft to changing the reality on the ground. The way things are progressing now, should the direct talks continue, a virtual Palestinian state might be the end result. I'm Jamal Dejani for the Mosaic Intelligence Report. For more about this program or to share your thoughts, visit us at linktv.org slash me. Stay up to date on the Middle East. Follow Jamal at twitter.com slash Jamal Dejani. The views expressed on Mosaic are from contributing broadcasters, not Link TV or its sponsors. The production of Mosaic is made possible from support of viewers like you. Thank you. Watch Mosaic World News online. Stay up to date with breaking news. Read our blog. Get transcripts of past shows and more at linktv.org slash mosaic. This program is brought to you by Link TV for educational and non commercial use only. Link TV is the only U.S. network dedicated to global and national news, uncompromising documentaries, and diverse cultural programs, programs which connect you to the world.